Hi everybody, this is Joanne from Read Science and I'm here once again with my co-host Jeff who seemed to turn into a picture instead of a video all of a sudden, but he will be here. And uh, today I am so excited to be joined by Kat Arney who hails from the UK but is currently sitting in Toronto. Kat, why didn't you go ahead and say hi before I formally introduce you? Hi, hello everyone. Okay, so you guys might recognize her, maybe at least her voice, from the Naked Scientist podcast and Naked Genetics. Um, and if not, and you want an excuse to get to know her, I'm going to highly recommend her book, Herding Hemingway's Cats, Understanding How Our Genes Work. And, of course, cats and the Internet and science, they're, they're all really good things. So... <laughs> I think it's perfect. So, and actually, let me introduce uh, Kat before I talk a little bit about the book and, and as we wait for Jeff to return, uh, because he usually throws out the first question. So, uh, let me find, oh, yes, let's see which document I put that in. Okay, so Dr. Kat Arney holds a degree in natural sciences and a PhD in developmental biology from Cambridge University and she did her postdoc at Imperial College London. Uh, so she knows what she is writing about. Uh, she is a writer, broadcaster, and public speaker, appearing on the highly successful Naked Scientist for the past decade, and producing and presenting the monthly Naked Genetics podcast, as well as co-presenting the weekly national BBC Radio 5 live science show. You can tell me if that's still happening. Still happens every single week. <laughs> that's so great. That's fantastic. And now, of course, she's written this book about um, genetics or how, well, not just genetics. I like to say it's genomics and uh, molecular biology these days, right? So because yeah. genetics to me always gives that sense of uh, Mendelian genetics, one gene, one disease, right? And we know that's just not always the case. Absolutely. That, that's a lot of what I wanted to explore was that, you know, we, we read about genes in the papers all the time. They, they make your eyes brown, they make your hair curly, they give you cancer, they make you fat, but like, how do they work? How do they do that? Uh, so that, that's really what I wanted to explore. Yeah, and you know, for, for me, I, um, I teach biology, obviously, I teach cell biology, I teach a course in genomics, and uh, having taught for so many years at the university level, uh, I, it's always sort of fun for me to recommend books to my students and to say, you know, if you want to sort of see the overarching view, rather than what you get in one class this semester and another class another semester, like these books tie things together. So good examples include uh, the Philadelphia chromosome, mm -hmm. which, you, which you have actually mentioned in your book. And we have had Jessica Wapner on the show. Uh, fantastic, um, you know, book. And the other one was P53, uh, which was about obviously the P53 gene, which is implicated in uh, cancer. And, you know, and then when I read your book, I went, oh, my goodness, this is even better because I will tell you, I was like, at the time, RNAi, we'll talk about that more, was sort of being discovered and papers being written. I was like busy raising children and not paying attention to that. And I was like, oh, my gosh, you know, I just at, even at that point, I felt so grateful that you had sort of explained it clearly and lucidly. Um, yeah, it was fantastic. So um, since Jeff will probably join us in a moment. <laughs> we lost him. We've lost him into the ether somewhere. I think so. Well, he, he usually uh, films from home, you know, on his day off. But now he's trying it from his office. And uh, okay. I think, you know, uh, I, I don't know if it's the Internet or maybe someone policing and saying, no, you can't be doing this, right? I don't. <laughs> I don't. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't think that's the case. So. Um, why don't we talk a little bit, just start a little bit about, um, since on this show we talk not only about the science, but how this process of science communication happens. Why don't you try to condense like your path of science communication and how that led to this book? Or, or you know, you can even go step back as far as, you know, I was working on a PhD and said, yeah, I don't want to apply for grants or whatever it is that motivated you to step towards communication and then to the book? So I've, I've always loved writing. 
and I, I love books. I've always been a big reader, a big writer. And when I was at school, I was always kind of torn between do I go into more the art side or the science side? And I'm a musician as well, come from a very musical family. And kind of half the family is, is writers and sort of arty people. And then the other half are accountants and, you know, those sort of uh, sciencey type people. So I've always had this pull in my life, but I realised that I really liked science. I was really good at science. So at school, I did all of that went to do a degree in science at Cambridge and a PhD but it was during I think during the end of my degree I really started doing science writing I was entering science writing competitions uh, I started writing for the university newspaper about science while I kind of thing got involved in the naked scientists for the first time and uh, yeah that kind of gave me the bug but then I thought no I've been told all my life I'm a scientist I'm gonna be a scientist you know I did really well at school and did really well at university. And so I started doing my PhD. I'm very, very clumsy. So <laughs> I had a real problem. Like I was just dropping things and breaking things. And when you're working with tiny, tiny embryos, it's, it's difficult. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And at the same time, I was doing all this science communication. I was writing, I was doing talks for kids and uh, all those kind of things. Uh, and again, sort of doing more with the naked scientists. And I still thought, no, 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 I have to be a scientist. I'm going to be a professor. My mum will be so proud. Uh, decided that I was going to do a postdoc, got to London uh, to do a postdoc. There's kind of a sort of loop where I wanted to go to the US, I wanted to go to Vienna, I wanted to go to Edinburgh, but the, uh, uh, my partner at the time didn't want to go, so I followed him, and that was a big mistake. Don't do that, ladies. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> not when you're that young, anyway. Uh, so I, I ended up very, very unhappy in the lab, but still really enjoying all the communication and loving science, but not being a scientist. Uh, and I had quite a bad period of depression where I, I just didn't know what to do with my life because I thought I was a scientist, but I could feel this, no, you're a, you're a writer, you're a talker, you love science. And then realized, I mean, this was about 12 years ago, that there was a career called science communication. It was kind of quite new back then. There weren't that many of us. And I applied for a job as a junior at the charity Cancer Research UK. And I was there for 11 and a half years and I'd just gone freelance. Oh, okay. Oh, you broke away. <laughs> yeah, so as, as the book came out, you know, there were more and more opportunities to do talks, to do more writing. So finally, I I mean, I've run my freelance writing career alongside being a science communicator at CRUK. They've been very tolerant of that. But finally, I've sort of reached escape velocity, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's kind, of, kind of how I got here. It's, well, you know, I, it seems... Uh, uh, cancer, cancer. What could you repeat that again? Cancer research. Can, cancer research UK. They're the, the yes, UK's biggest yes. research charity. Right. So Ed Young got his start there too. So you know. Oh yeah, he was my colleague. <laughs> yeah, we we did the, we did a blog together at CRUK, and it, you know we won awards, and it was it was absolutely great. So so maybe uh, the can, cancer research UK uh, in their benefits you could possibly break free and become a great <laughs> well known yeah. science communicator. <laughs> I have to say, as, as somewhere to learn how to communicate science and a great environment, it was fantastic. And I, I miss my colleagues there so much. If you're watching, guys, I miss you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope they are. That's so fantastic. So um, actually, I just noted, I'm, I'm distressed Jeff is missing because he would have these great questions from the viewpoint of a physicist who's still grappling with biology, but um, I noticed your, and you mentioned this, that your name on um, Twitter is Harpist Cat. Yes. And, and this is because you play the harp and you must play it quite well. Uh, that's, that's a matter of opinion. I, I, I play, I play in a couple of bands and I do weddings and, and things like that. And it's, yeah, it's something I've done for a long time. And uh, I, I try not to cross the streams. My sister is a musician and a science comedian, and she sings songs about science. But I, I don't, I don't cross the streams in that way. I do, you know, I do my own music stuff, and I, I keep the science separate. But yeah, it's it's nice to have that that takes me completely, completely away from it. 
Right. Well, and I think it's important, you know, that uh, scientists, you know, continue to let the world know that we are multidimensional. We aren't merely, you know, in the lab, uh, uh, even though we could definitely be in the lab all day, every day. And many of us certainly have tried. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's good for other people to know, um, yeah. you know that, that we're multidimensional, that we aren't just science. And that's kind of why I wanted to, to do the book like I have. So the book is all about first person interviews because I love talking to scientists. And that's how I find out about their work. I go around and I talk to them and I say, you know, tell me what's hot, tell me what's weird. Uh, and they were telling me all this stuff. And I thought, you know, I have to do this book as interviews, as the story of me meeting these people and talking to people because they have characters. They're some of them quite grumpy or they're fun or they have, you know, the figuring things out. These aren't necessarily questions that we have all the answers to. Uh, so I think trying to portray scientists as real people that have disagreements and views and characteristics and traits, I think is very important. Yes, you did. Every every chapter started with, uh, you know, hey, I got on the elevator and with my, you know, you had your, your coffee of choice of the day and, you <laughs> know, and, uh, yes, and then you were uh, heading towards, I, you know what I mean? It was like, and I, and I was invited to their office, you described their office, you some traits of the scientists, and then, you know, the conversation, the way you shared the conversation, it could have been very dry. But no, you shared like, you know, you made it colorful and you made it, you know, uh, I don't know. It was it was very interesting. And I like that it, it um, instead of being like, yes, I interviewed these people and, or, the, you know, make it. Yes. Like, you know, third person. Oh, he does this. He does this. It was really like you had this conversation and you were like then turning around to tell us, hey, you know, I met the most interesting person today. Because I, I love that. I love sitting in the pub with people and saying, oh, my God, so I, I was working on this great story today. There's this, you know, there's this woman who's discovered X, Y, Z. I have to tell you about it. That's, that's the thing I love doing. And I, I don't know, I, hopefully my friends are not too bored of it. But um, <laughs> I, I absolutely love just telling people about great stories I found. And so when it came to writing the book, it was like, yeah, it's, it's like sitting in the pub having a beer with me and, and I'll tell you these stories. So how many people did you interview? It was a lot. <laughs> oh gosh, I think in total it was over 40 and I transcribed them all. <laughs> I could have written like three books from the transcripts. Uh, I think I had over 200,000 words of transcription by the oh, time wow. I'd finished. Uh, and then I hacked that down. So I think there are about 20 people's stories in, in total. And it was okay. really hard to decide who stays in, who goes out. There are a couple of chapters that, that got axed, so maybe they will appear somewhere else uh, ah. in another form, perhaps one day. But yeah, everyone I spoke to shaped my thinking, because what I didn't want to do was just write a kind of, oh, this is, this is what I think, this is what I've read. And also in genetics, there are kind of arguments going on at the moment about how much of the genome is junk, what do these different types of RNA do, uh, can we inherit non-genetic characteristics through the germline, uh, through the generations. And yeah, talking to people, coming up with where do I think we are. This isn't a, this isn't a very neutral book. I'm definitely in one camp uh, with the kind of the grumps and the skeptics. Uh, on this. So it's quite different from some other books that have been written on a similar topic uh, lately in the past kind of year or so. Yeah, well, and I, I fall into this thing, of course, being a cell biologist and an educator and, uh, and having read a lot of books, sometimes I'll just go, hmm, another genetics book, uh, you know, yeah. but then usually I'm very glad I've read it. You know what I mean? So like even yours, I went, another one. Well, how is she going to be different? And it was different enough and, and, you know, enough information. I went, oh, thank goodness. Oh, you know, I love this book. Now it's easy for me to go, read this book, come on. You know, and, and I even think, you know, I'll, I'll refer to it as I'm sort of refreshing my course for the summer, the genomics course. Um, because if we do fall, um, here's one thing that really, uh, we can talk about epigenetics here. <laughs> because epigenetics just, you know, the, the quick and dirty is, oh, it's methylation of this, of the histones, and then it doesn't fold properly, and therefore, 
you know, it leaves it more open and more able to be transcribed. But you went yeah. into so much de more detail. It's not, not just like, not detail as in, let's talk about every little thing. It was like, no, but uh, epigenetics is also this, and it's also this, and it's also this. And that was, you know, I was like, oh, what a wonderful way to yeah. encapsulate everything. Yeah. I mean, I, I worked on epigenetics before I, before it was cool. That's what I did my PhD in. And uh, and I think it's, it's a word that's so badly abused. It really needs to be in therapy. You know, it's become like the quantum of biology. So you get people like Deepak Chopra and people who don't really understand biology going, oh, yes, yeah, it's, it's epigenetic, right? Any, anything yeah. we don't understand or is a bit kind of weird. And whatever really you ate yesterday, that is going to, you know, yes, influence yeah. everything or your thoughts. What you yeah. thought, that's changing your DNA. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, stop. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like, it, yes, of course, our, the, our genes change in their level of activity all the time. And that's how cells work. They sense a change and they respond and genes go on and genes go off and, and that's kind of how it works. But yeah, this it's all become tied up with this, does it go through the generations? And, and then anyone who's a particular aficionado of this, there's been a wonderful argument raging over the past week or so about an article about epigenetics that was written by Siddhartha Mukherjee, who I think is yes. an incredible writer in his book, uh, The Emperor of All Maladies. It's amazing cancer book. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> incredible cancer book. Uh, I read it on my honeymoon, which was, <laughs> I don't know what that says about me. Um, but yeah, that yeah, he's kind of got into trouble, I think, for falling into some traps about epigenetics that I worked really hard to avoid in my book because I knew that they were there and a lot of the people that I spoke to was like don't fall into this mistake the epigenetic stuff the marks all these kind of things they're not the magic they're not necessarily as important as we think they might be that there are sort of these underlying mechanisms that are very important as well so there's there's a lot of confusion I think even in the field of scientists and science communicators about what epigenetics is so I, I really did spend a lot of time getting my thoughts straight and working out, okay, what exactly can we say about this that is true? And what is kind of the hand wavy stuff? Right, and I, I personally, I think um, if nothing else, that is one great reason to get your book. <laughs> because, <I was> like, <laughs> if you yeah, want like, to know what epigenetics actually is, <laughs> Right, right. If if you feel like oh, it's just this, it, like if you could give a knee jerk response that you think it's just this, then you are probably wrong, and you should you know read this to get a better idea. So yeah, I was actually going to ask you know, if, of course you would have followed the the whole thing with Siddhartha Mukherjee because I love his book. Uh, his book is out today. Just for those of you watching who might be. Oh, it's out today, the gene. And I um, it. I'm gonna have it when I get home from Canada then. <laughs> oh great. Oh, that's so great. Yes, okay. I have mine and I need to start reading it, but I I've had a fun weekend with my my kids, some kids graduating birthdays, blah blah. One returning from Ecuador. So yeah, I, I've been a little busy, but it's so so um there there was a part of me that thought, oh, I love Emperor of All Maladies. He's an oncologist, he's you know. So it's his area. So I am, there's a part of me that's a little dubious. So how is he going to do with the gene? And then yeah. when this article came out and people, you know, trounced him on that one, I was like, oh, no, 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 no. You can't, it can't be true. I want him to be a great writer about the gene too. But I, we'll see. We'll see. I have to read and make my own assessment. Yeah, definitely. I, I think there's still, I mean, there's a lot of books about genetics, but it's always interesting to see what individual people bring because I couldn't talk to everyone. I've made my, you know, I've made my tent in the camp that I'm in. And there are different opinions and there's different, you know, people have evidence from different sources. Some people do this experiment on all these things and they come up with this answer. Some people do very fine detailed experiments on a tiny number of cells and they have different answer. So there are different stories to be told in a narrative. So it's, I think it's always interesting reading what other writers take right. from the people that they talk to and the papers that they read. So yeah, I will, I will be very interested to, to read about it because I think, you know, I, I did an event with a guy who's a psychologist uh, in the UK, he's, there's been a bit of fuss 
where he basically thinks that no psychological traits are in the genes at all. And I did an event with him and he actually said, I think we know everything there is to know about genetics now. No. <laughs> we are, it feels like we're really just, just opening that box now. And it's an incredibly exciting time to be thinking about genetics, to be writing about it, to be talking to these people, because there's, there's just such an incredible feeling of excitement that we're really starting to find stuff out now, whereas maybe we were kind of struggling before. So uh, it's, it's, it's a good time to be learning and to be communicating about genetics. Yes, I, I agree. You know what? I'm going to uh, see if we can get Jeff to ask a question before he disappears. We're so excited you're back, Jeff. Can you hear us? I can I can hear you. I can see you. Everything is fine. Hello. But I'm cursing technology right now. So, <laughs> well, we we will uh, we've talked about many things, but I trust your question will be a little different. If not, I'm sure Cat won't mind going over. <laughs> that's that's right. I have to catch up. Fortunately, this is being you know video recorded, so I could watch the entire thing later and see what I missed. But here, if I can find it. After rebooting the computer and oh, oh no, sorts. yeah, it was one of those days. Um. <laughs> so <laughs> when uh, this is where I was going to start, and I wanted to start with sort of the big thing that we could shape down and, and get through all of these various topics in the book that you organized so well. So say when I was young, and this is going to be like pre Cretaceous, but I was younger. Uh, we normal people understood very well. The genes mapped onto characteristics, that there was a gene for red hair, there was a gene for a nose's shape, there was a gene for eye color, you name it, there was a gene for it. And to use a phrase that you wrote in the book, you said the progression from genotype to phenotype for us was much simpler then. And now it's different, so I have another quote from what you, you said. One mutation, one effect, one G fault, one disease, it would be nice and neat, wouldn't it? Yet everything we know about biology says that it's completely wrong. And I think that's exciting, but it's like, what happened? What's been going on for the last year? <laughs> How did we, you know, back then, and this is another thing I've noticed, back when I was in high school, the big question in anything, I don't know, that had to do with development was, how did cells differentiate? And that question has gone away because the context has shifted so much and we understand things so much differently. And so how do you, however you want to do that, it's like, you know, the big overview, but a lot of stuff has happened, which you cover, but what's the big picture? What has been going on that has changed this picture so much and how has it changed? I think this is an excellent question to follow up what we were just talking about. So it's good. Yeah. I, I think what's one of the things that has changed is being able to read the sequence of DNA, being able to like really look at all the letters that are there, uh, to be able to zoom in and see what molecules, what these things called transcription factors that turn genes on and off, what's stuck where, what's doing what. Uh, we know more about, we, we were talking about this idea of epigenetics, the mm -hmm. kind of the, the switches on top of the switches that keep genes locked on or locked off, perhaps, maybe. Um, I don't know how cynical you are about these things. But yeah, just the, the amount of molecular knowledge we have is now incredible. But I think that the, there is this mistaken idea that uh, a gene is for a trait. But there's mm -hmm. no such thing as a gene for uh, right. a disease. Or, you know, there's no such thing as the toe gene. So the book's called Herding Hemingway's Cats because these cats have extra digits. Mm -hmm. But there's no such thing as, like, the toe gene. It's not a fault in it a toe gene. It's a fault in a molecule that helps cells decide are you going to be a digit or not a digit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so genes are recipes that makes make molecules in our cells. And it's getting that idea of what do these molecules do? So we've gone from, from a sort of very Mendelian idea that there's this this genetic change and you get a, a trait that the fruit flies, all the fruit fly work that was done a century ago is a really good example of that. You, you make a change in a fruit fly and they have red eyes or white eyes or curly wings or something like that. It's a really obvious change. But you have to drill down and go, no, 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 because there isn't such a thing as a gene for curly wings. 
there was a molecular change in a recipe in that fly's cells that has changed the sort of molecular makeup of those cells. So now, as the wings grow, they do something different. So kind of getting that across that that these are molecular recipes that our cells use, and then how do all our cells work together to make us who we are, and how do all these recipes work? That's kind of what we're trying to understand now, and it's yeah, it's a complicated picture now, unfortunately. <laughs> But, but it's interesting and complicated, yes, but if you have a good tour guide, thank you for your book, you could make it through it. But, uh, and there are a couple of things where you've pretty much convinced me through the book that gene is hardly a concept worth trying to use if you want to speak precisely about things. And I do like to do things precisely because I'm a physicist. Now from that physicist view, an, an insight, a physicist type insight was it seems like from 40 years ago we shifted from what I would describe as a static field picture. Here's a gene, it causes these noses, these eyes, these things, to this time dependent developmental idea. And yeah. so, not to be all Evo Devo and things, but that developmental picture that, that DNA through all these various mechanisms controls development and not results. Yeah. You get to the phenotype by going through all of this and I felt I felt really uh, I don't know observant when I realized that 30 years ago when you saw a clone in a movie someone would contribute some cells they would grow a clone the clone would be 32 years old. <laughs> we understand now that you can make clones but that they have to go through this developmental process to express that genotype. Yeah. It's like, this is a big shift, this static to dynamic thing. And once you open up that, that idea of processes, you get like 10 chapters in your book, right? Yeah, I mean, one, one of the, the analogies that I came up with, I think I came up with this when I was really drunk at a party <laughs> trying to explain to someone how it worked, uh, which is where I have all my great ideas. Um, but it was the idea of the video game. So, you know, if you play a video game, yes. uh, and the, the analogy I use, it's like kind of a quest. You, you start in a dungeon, it's just you, and you have to go through all the, the levels. You have to pick up the weapons, you have to learn the skills, you have to get the moves, you have to unlock the next stage. You can't just skip to the rescue at the end. You have to do, you can't just jump and skip any of these levels because every level is setting you up for the next thing. Mm -hmm. And it's it's that idea of development. And so I, I talk a lot in the book about these the idea of control switches. So you get molecules that sit on the control switches and turn a gene on and that helps say a cell become a muscle cell or a nerve cell or a, a, a finger cell. And uh, um, every time I give talks about this, people say, but what turns the switches on to make those molecules? And you're like, okay, so we have to go back, and, it, and then we have to go back, and you end up going all the way back to the fertilized egg, where these kind of changes and the, these switches start going on, genes get turned on, genes get turned off, cells divide, cells specialize, and eventually you've built a human, and then the he our genes as, as an adult, respond to our environment and changes and in information that's coming in. Mm -hmm. So you sort of, I, I end up doing like a potted developmental biology, epigenetic <laughs> molecular biology talk. I don't know, 45 minutes to people sitting above. <laughs> that's what I do now. But one, one <clears throat> insight, I guess, or observation that one of your, your interviewees said, you were, you were talking about, I'm looking now, Marie Claire King. And you said in 1975, she wrote a science paper in which she said, and I think you're paraphrasing, that it must be that the way genes are used and not the proteins they encode that make us so different from our closest relatives. And this is, this is once you can shift your mind, right? If we are virtually identical in the genome to chimpanzees, how can we be so different from chimpanzees? And that has to say it's not in the encoding, it's in how the encoding guides something else, right? Yeah, so basically our, our proteins, the, the bits of the actual genes in our genome, that 2% of our genome that is honest to God protein coding, that's pretty much identical between us and chimps. I mean, there are some arguments around the edges. I've talked to some people who say, no, no, that the tiny differences that are there are important. 
I talk to other people who say, no, they're not. It's kind of you know, apples and oranges until you start doing experiments where you're swapping in. Yes. Uh, and I, I gave a talk at Google and someone was like, how many things would you need to swap to turn a human into a chimp? Like, okay, Google's next project is getting pretty dark. Um, yes, but, but we know so, the answer pretty much. We, we know the answer. And uh, one of the chapters in the book, I've talked to a guy in Cambridge called Duncan Odom. He's looked at 20 different species of mammals. And he finds, yeah, that the protein coding genes, the genes are pretty much the same. But it's the switches that, that evolve and shuffle mm -hmm. very dramatically. And that's kind of, you know, what makes the difference. All mammals are kind of the same. Yeah. We've all got a head here, a tail here, liver, kidneys, lungs, heart, you know, reproductive yeah. organs. We're, we're basically sophisticated mice. Uh, yes. We just have smaller ears and less hair. Uh, but, you know, it's that the switches move and change through evolution. And, and that's really one of the things that first got me into writing the book, was learning about the Hemingway cats. Mm -hmm. Because they had a change in the control switch. And that's made a change in their body shape. And then there's a lovely story about some sticklebacks, where just a very small change yes. is the difference between two species of sticklebacks, and one has a pelvis with these kind of yes. death spikes sticking out of it, and, and the other species doesn't. And yeah, where, did, awesome where did that come from? But and here's, here's sort of a real question that comes from that, I think. That you, you were talking about who has, who has the most letters in their genome. And it turns out to be this stupid plant in China has the Aristotica. biggest genome of anyone uh, outdoing this toad over here. I can't even remember what it was now. Or this onion or leek, I guess, you know, some allium of some sort. How much has <laughs> human hubris our need to be at the <laughs> pinnacle of you know, the evolutionary ladder gotten in the way of seeing how genes are actually turning on, turning off, and expressing things just because we think ours should be the most complicated. We should have the most genes. We should have the biggest DNA. And that's not a good scientific attitude, is it? No, I mean, I remember when, when I was doing my PhD, so this was like uh, the end of the 90s, the beginning of the 2000s, and it was just around about the time they were coming close to getting the first draft of the human genome. And we would all blithely say, oh yeah, there's about 100,000 genes in the human genome. This was just bandied around commonly yeah. in scientific circles. And I talk to some people now, uh, and they go, oh, no, 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 no one, no one who knew anything ever said that. We always thought there were fewer. And you go, mm -hmm. in, in a lot of scientific circles, it was this idea, because they worked out there's about 20,000 genes in a fruit fly, there's about 20,000 genes in a nematode worm. We make hundreds of thousands of proteins, so we're going to have hundreds of thousands of genes. But no, we don't. We have about 20,000 actual genes. Um, yeah, one of the things that I do end up exploring at the end of the book is kind of what is the gene anyway? Uh, and there's a lot of arguments about how much of the genome that we call non-coding, we must not call it junk, that hesses me off, mm -hmm. um, how much of the non-coding genome is useful, is not useful. There are some very raging arguments going on about this. But there has been this, this idea that the genome, and I, I think, and you know, I, I'm obviously aware that you guys are in the US, and I hate to criticize US people, but the, um, the intelligent design creationists have got a lot to answer for here. A lot. Fair, idea, fair enough. We're yeah, not going to argue with you on somehow, that. Somehow the genome was designed and everything in it has a role and is important. And this is simply not true. That there is stuff that is just there. And I think a good analogy that I'm using quite a lot is, you know how everyone's got that box of cables that they have in their house? <laughs> and when you move house, you take the box of cables. Yeah, you go on. <laughs> you take the box of cables with you. And, you know, some of them are defunct. Some of them might come in useful. Some of them, like, I'm sure this fits something. And some of them are genuinely just, like, you just pick this up, you know. And our genome has junk in it. It's not perfectly crafted and designed. And it's not winnowed by evolution to be... You know, the, the no. pinnacle of our species. None of us is the pinnacle of our species. We're a work in progress. No, evolution um, is much more opportunistic than that. And I think understanding these mechanisms uh, uh, is, is 
maybe the best way or the surest way to open people's eyes to the fact of how silly the argument is, how can you, you know, how could you have a gene for the eye come about all at once? And it's like clearly, once you have this developmental picture, these evolutionary mechanisms, these various control issues, that's that's just a ridiculous question, almost as ridiculous as as cell differentiation or something. Yeah, and the sticklebacks are a really great example because a, a tiny change, it's like a, a couple of hundred letters that just kind of gets cut out. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, this is a random mutation, just happens. It's the difference between having this pelvis structure with these kind of protective spikes. Right. So right. That structure is completely missing because the control switch means that an important gene doesn't get turned on at the right time in development to help these fish build the pelvis and the spikes. And that's happened in 10,000 years, which is like the blink of an eye in evolutionary terms. And so you can actually, when you start to hear those stories, you can see how you know, the argument that, oh, we haven't had enough time on Earth for species mm -hmm. to evolve and all these differences to accumulate, that is simply not true, because that's assuming that evolution proceeds by single letter changes in the DNA, and it's this very slow creeping, mm -hmm. bigger, bit smaller, bit fatter, bit thinner, you know, that idea. But if you start fiddling with the switches, you can make yes. really dramatic yes. changes, and, that, and then you yeah. can start getting really big differences. Which, which brings me to maybe the last two questions of this period or something, Joanne, but, you know, reading these layers of things, so here's the genome, here, here's the, the DNA, it's making proteins, these are going out and making other proteins that are going off and doing work, and then you have, you have switches over here that turn these on and off during developmental thing, fine, and you have methylation that affects something, you have things that come in and snip things and move things around, all these layers of processes, um, and I can see that. We can build them up. I'm happy with that reductionist, unreductionist approach. I had a remaining question, and the simple one first, I think, is a lot of those are more prone to selective pressures and evolution operation, presumably at different rates. And that's what we were just starting to get at, is that a lot of these things could change a lot faster and uh, do evolutionary experiments a lot more successfully and a lot broader. And the remaining question I had that I didn't get the answer to was, what's controlling the control mechanisms? So are these things that switch things on and off, but then clearly you know, there's something that's controlling those or controlling the snipping or controlling the methylation. Do we have know about those things too? Yeah, no, I mean all of those things are proteins, they're enzymes, so you have these enzymes that put on the epigenetic marks, you know, the marks on top of DNA or on top of the proteins that package DNA, these things called histones, yeah. so those are enzymes and some of them do jobs at particular times in development, some of them kind of get switched on by signals coming in from outside cells mm -hmm. and again it's, it's kind of tracking back through development right back to the egg that every stage sets up getting the right things in the right place to set the next stage up. So you know the, the molecules that you need to make a muscle cell, you have to go back to when the first little clump of cells in a tiny embryo was specialized as being, okay, we're going to be the middle layer of the embryo. And then a group of those you know, changes happen in them or they realize they're in the right place and they're getting the right information from other cells to go, okay, let's turn these things on. And then they start making the journey towards becoming muscle and they go through mm -hmm. those steps. So, you know, we only have 20,000 genes, but the combinations of them and the order that they get used, uh, that's how we get this diversity. And you showed some mechanisms that say even when one gene is being controlled and doing all of its hierarchy of things, how that happens depends on whether the same one is present in the second chromosome over that matches it, whether there's another gene over here someplace, yeah. ten, 10 kilogenes. You know, and you get all these wonderful things, away. you know, kind of cutting and pasting of, of the RNA, the message that's kind of copied from DNA. Uh, there's one, one example that I use, there's a gene called DSCAM in Drosophila, which is involved in helping Drosophila's, uh, the fruit fly, helping its nerve cells wire up in the brain. It makes yeah. sure that cells are all different in the brain and don't short circuit by wiring into each other, in, into the same cell. And so this single gene is snipped up, it, it's made in like 
it's, I think it's something like 28,000 different versions mm. from one gene. Mm -hmm. it's, it's absolutely incredible. Is that the well, most efficient way of doing it? Who knows? It's the way that the flies have evolved to make sure that a, they build a brain that works. What, the collection of proteins that are in the brain at the ends of nerve cells in the brain that are all different mutations and made in yeah. different combinations. It's, it's just incredible. For apparently what turns out to be a good reason. Yeah. yeah. What, a, what an evolutionary mess it was. <laughs> <laughs> it is, I think the thing that really has got me, there's been a couple of things that um, have really solidified for me just how incredible biology is. And also that evolution explains how we got here and how we work is that these are incredibly inefficient processes. Mm -hmm. Most of these things in our cells, they're, they're, you can tell the way things work, they've kind of been botched together. So like you can see that oh, something was kind of working and then something, another process happened to be there and got dragged in. Uh, you know, there was nothing neat and designed about most of the biological processes we have in our cells. Yeah. You could, if you were an engineer, a process engineer, you could design them way more efficiently. Back in the earliest days of the Macintosh computer, there was this funky little program whose sole purpose was to make the computer run 10,000 times slower. <laughs> and it would be amusing for a little bit, and what you would do is you would go and click on a file menu, and you would watch the menu get drawn. And the most, wow. the most interesting thing to me about that was that you'd see the outline come down, and you'd see the little lines go across, and you'd see shading come in, and then it'd erase it and do it over again. And you'd like to think, wouldn't those engineers have just done that once? Wouldn't that be more efficient? But, you know, it's a big enough process. It's like evolution. You, in a flash of an eye, you don't see it at real speed, but slow down the mechanism yeah. for accomplishing that is horribly wasteful. There, there's clunky things and there's redundancy and there's like, you know, genes that seem to apparently do the same things. And, and sometimes that's actually useful. And the reason that they're there is that as conditions change, yes. sometimes it's useful to have backups or as things get broken, you know. So, so stuff is, has evolved to be there, but uh, it's yeah. not the most efficient. But and the other thing that, that, that really blew my mind when I realized it is that everything, all of this, how our genes work, how our cells work, fundamentally, and you're like this, boils down to physics. Yes. And as a biologist, I was so upset when I realized this, <laughs> that, oh, God, it's actually physics. That we're dealing with things on an atomic level. These are molecules, real molecules, not lines drawn in, in a scientific paper with little boxes and circles sitting on them. These are molecules and shapes of molecules interacting together. And those interactions can be wobbly. And yep. some are more stable and some are less stable. And that's what determines whether a gene is more active or less active. Yes. And these are fundamentally stochastic, well, uh, random. These are fundamentally random processes. No, I, I, that, I like the word stochastic, but... Uh, yes, yes. I, li I like how, like how you said it <laughs> yeah. several and, times in the book, and you said, yes, we like to say that. And you know what? I will say one thing. Uh, not only <laughs> is it physics, but, of course, it's chemistry, which is really it's physics. Old. Yeah. But, but it, I remember someone getting really upset. Why do the biologists keep winning, like, awards? Like, why do they keep winning the chemistry Nobel Prize? And <laughs> when, it comes, when it comes down to it, though, cells do chemistry really, really well, you yeah. know? Essentially, when then of course then it's really physics, but still. But it's kind of it's organized chemistry, yeah. and you're, right. what's basically happening is that these molecules don't know where to go. They're kind of moving around, and they, they find a place on the DNA that, that fits, that feels comfy. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, a change in a letter of DNA that makes them fit better or not so good. Mm -hmm. And that's how a gene might be more or less active if there's kind of very subtle changes. Mm -hmm in the well, DNA sequence around as a, it. As a committed reductionist, I'm happy to see those connections being made. And, and uh, as a physicist, I'll bet, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you mentioned, you know, butterflies in there. And so as a researcher who worked in the early days of, of chaos and turbulence matters and things like that, that's also nice to see. And it's, it's always, you know, at the same time that I sort of look on with an air of superiority, go, uh-huh, that happens. It's nice to see complexity develop. <laughs> you know, yeah. emerge from these things. But it all underscored 
for me in the biological picture how opportunistic evolutionary mechanisms are and how how brilliant that is not that anybody designed it because who would make a mess like that but it's like what an amazing 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 thing it is that these things keep getting bent in the shape and through all these and mechanisms and randomness you've got uncountable numbers of, of varieties and changes and the for endless forms ever wonderful or whatever exactly. the, the yeah. is. But endless it, forms it, most beautiful. Yeah. yeah. It's it is incredible that yeah, it's it's organized chemistry. And I think that, that does make it challenging to really pin down in a very reductionist way. Yes, this gene absolutely does mm -hmm. this, that gene absolutely does that. Because another of the things that surprised me that I learned was that you know, where maybe at school we learn about this, you have one gene fault that leads to one trait and one disease. Actually, we're now, now we're starting mm -hmm. to sequence more people's genomes. We're taking, yes. instead of taking people who have a disease or a condition and looking in their genomes and saying, okay, what's wrong? And going, ah, oh, you have a fault in that gene, that's why you got breast cancer. We're taking people who are completely healthy and rifling through their genomes and going, ah, oh, there is, you have this gene that means oh. you should, you should be ill, but you're not. And we're all walking around with changes that should be potentially damaging or harmful to our health, but they may not express themselves. Yeah. So it's the combination of everything you've got together, plus this biological wobble, plus the influence of your environment, that makes you who you are and how healthy you are and all this kind of stuff. And that's with that, with that hard whole, to figure out. Uh, whole reductionist spectrum that you have going on here then, how do you, the, the big problem is knowing where to stop, right? Yeah. Maybe where to begin. So the question as, a, as an author and communicator is like, any tips for how to organize material like this? <laughs> Don't do it the way I did it, I don't know. <laughs> I've never written a book before. I've never written anything longer than like 5,000 words. Uh, yeah. And so it was, it was a learning experience for me as well, <laughs> writing that book. I, I basically, I just talked to a whole bunch of people mm -hmm. and said, what are the stories here? Mm -hmm. and, the, and started to thread them together like, like beads on a string. And so hopefully it kind of like, I pull people through this, this story, because well, it, it's as much as my, my discovery of what's going on. It's almost that you organized chapters. I mean, there's there's a sense of progression through these mechanisms and things, but also a feeling that each one is sort of coalescing around a central mm -hmm. story told by one person that you talk to. And I think that's, there's a fine line there because Joanne would have heard me say before, I hate, I hate cult writing that sees, you know, scientists as some sort of god or something. <laughs> but that doesn't mean either. that I think, I don't think avoiding personalities is necessarily called for either. And so it's nice to see some people, but that what we're getting out of them is not their personal story, but their scientific story. And that, that seemed to work quite well yeah. with some other organizational ideas going on. I, I really hate that whole kind of, there was a very clever man and he did a great thing, because it's always a man. I, I hate that kind of thing, <laughs> because scientists are opinionated and you know mm -hmm. I, I am a scientist by training I have been to so many scientific conferences I sit and I get drunk with them and we chat and it's yeah, like yeah. it's that that I want to capture when when the guard is down when they're not being the great scientist it's like what do you what do you really think what's confusing what's weird you know tell right, me what's right. actually going on yeah, and what might be the future and things like that. So actually, since we're sort of talking about how the book was organized and what, what the, the feel of the book is, you had some colorful language. <laughs> I, like, like, I, like, I, think I, I won Jeff over with the word saucy. I said, this book is saucy. It's saucy. <laughs> saucy yeah. molecular biology. And uh, so did, did, you, did your editor go, awesome, love that tone, this is great, or did they go, Ooh, ooh, you know, this might go to an American audience. And some yeah. of them are like this. <laughs> he, he really, my, my editor is, is great, and he's, um, he's, he's been fantastic. He's a guy called Jim, who also I go out and get drunk with quite a lot. I, I do that a lot. Um, but yeah, he really loved the tone. It's, it's a very chatty, conversational book. It's kind of, if you spend any time sitting around chatting to me, it's exactly how I speak, and probably a bit more sweary. 
in real life. Uh, but yeah, there, there's, there's, there's a bit of swearing. Um, I was made to take some of it out. Mm-hmm. Um, but still. But you know, it's, now, it, it's not a book that totally preys on all the pop, you know, there's not too much pop culture, no. clever, clever stuff in there. Um, but in the midst of all the conversational stuff, this is just a short one, Joanne. Uh, Joanne knows that one of my, I keep hammering people on the idea of precision of their writing and not getting things wrong. But there was, so there is one commendable thing. It's like even in the midst of a chatty, comfortable, casual sort of thing, you can still do good science and present it carefully. And so there's one place where I made a note where you were about to say every cell in your body, I think you were going to finish by saying, you know, has the same DNA, uh, except you put in a footnote. You said, except red blood cells, which lose their DNA as they mature. I really approved of that because if you had just said, every cell in your body does this, I might have said, everyone? And then I would have been stuck. And so, but making it a footnote seemed appropriate to me. I'm a pedant. Um, I'm a real pedant, and that kind of stuff really bugs me. I'm, I'm full of putting in the, you know, so, uh, you know, every cellular body has the same DNA, more or less. More or uh, less. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's more or less. How much yeah. detail do you need? Well, but, yeah, I, I, it's really important to me that it's scientifically correct, but without being overly detailed. and mm-hmm. Right. And, and so... So this is the problem with science communication, right? When we're trying to read a, reach a general audience or an interested general audience, maybe they're mm-hmm. not scientists, is uh, the thing they say about science communication. Oh, you want to make it brief and succinct, but scientists always want to qualify. Well, <laughs> yes, in this instance, or sometimes no, uh, you know, maybe, possibly. You know, like, because we, we recognize where science is not solid, in our, especially in our field, so we're just sort of like, well... Not exactly, but when you're trying to communicate, it, yeah, no. the reader you're going to lose the reader if you keep saying that. But I felt like you struck a good balance. We said mm-hmm. some of this is still controversial. Some of this is so. So tell us a little bit about how you feel because you do podcasts. Boy, those podcasts had better be succinct and let's say this and let's get our audience and let's <laughs> you know also get the science right. Exactly, exactly, and I I think that's about letting the scientists tell the story, but then also engaging and, you know, I'll always put in asides or it's mm-hmm. about knowing your subject. I spend a lot of time reading scientific papers, going to conferences, talking to scientists, so that I I really know the story, so that I can help scientists tell the story. Because I, I think that sometimes science journalists can fall into that, I'll just ask these questions and mm-hmm. whatever they say, that must be true. Um, so yeah, I think that really knowing, really knowing my stuff is very important to me. And actually, it was one of my favourite reviews was from Nature, the scientific journal. That was I got a great review, and I was like, yes, <laughs> scientist, gonna, I got this kind of more or less right. That I have to admit, I will confess, there are some mistakes in the book. Um, <laughs> I leave it as an exercise to the reader to figure those out. <laughs> but yeah, there, there is. There are a couple of factual errors. Some people have pointed out a couple of things to me. Um, but there's, there's I think more. it's inevitable, though. It's inevitable, unfortunately. Yeah. There's we're, one. We're like, yeah, there's one I think I've got the month when they give out the Nobel Prizes wrong. I'm like, I don't even know how that happened. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I wrote, I, I said they're in December when they're not, and I, I think I must have written December at some point elsewhere. But they, they get the, they, the presentation is in December, but they call them in October. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So, um, yes, yes. These yes. things, I'll correct them in the paperback. It's fine. That's okay. right. That, that's right. You can. So we'll have to make sure to get the paperback and yeah. now. comb through and make sure it's uh, whatever. So, uh, Jeff, do you have any other uh, I I big do, and questions? I had one that I was okay. saving for the very end or near the very Good. end. because And it's Kat's fault because she was... <laughs> She was writing, and this is early on in the book, you were writing about a conversation you were having with, I think I miswrote it, but is it Dan Grain? Dan Grau. Yeah. It's my favorite. <laughs> and you said to him, what's the one thing you want people to understand about what's in our genome and how it works? Well, guess what your question is. <laughs> what's the one thing now <laughs> that you want to have people know about the genome 
and how it works or doesn't work. Knowing that the book sets out to try to clarify many of our naive misunderstandings, I think we could assume that that's understood. I, I think that it's that there is no such thing as a gene for. Mm -hmm. It's really getting across the idea that genes are the recipes our cells use to, to make them work. It's, it's this amazing recipe book, and it's how that all works together. That's what makes us mm -hmm. who we are. And then from that, you can infer as much it's complicated as you like. But yeah, so getting away from this, that it's a very sort of linear one gene, one thing. That these mm -hmm. are, it's, it's a wonderful kitchen of ideas, of, of recipes. Yep, I think that's a, a very good answer. <laughs> Yeah. It, it's great. It's great. So, uh, so now that Jeff asked that, I, I do want to give you the opportunity. Is there anything that mm -hmm. we should have asked you that we didn't that you might want to <laughs> to let that you go? Oh gosh, I have my moment to talk to however many people find me on YouTube later. <laughs> Buy my book. <laughs> um, no, I, I I really think it's a fantastic time to be learning about. Uh, genetics and we're all going to have to grapple with this you know people yeah. are getting uh, a couple of friends of mine have just had their 23 and me genomes done and they're kind of coming and asking me all these questions uh, I had a friend of mine who got his results back and said wow I thought I was pure red British but this suddenly says a quarter of my genomes come from Europe you know have right. my grandparents been lying to me <laughs> like, no 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 this is how it works it's complicated and so I think uh, at a point in the not too distant future, we are going to be getting medical results that involve our genomes, mm -hmm. our genetics affects how we respond to certain drugs, our risks of diseases, you know, all sorts of things. I really think the general public needs to just get a bit more of a sophisticated understanding of what's in our genomes mm -hmm. and how they work, because it's, it's us, it's us, it's entirely our own human story, it's what makes us who we are. And, uh, and I really want to encourage everyone to find out a bit more about what's going on. Yes, I think, and your book is a great way to do it. And I, I, you know, we're at the bottom of the hour, so I guess we can wrap it up and say, what a delight it's been to have Kat That's on. Uh, Thank you. Oh my gosh, it's been so good. And I loved, loved reading your book. And like Thank I you. said, every time I see a book about genes, I go, Another book about genes. Oh. You know, so what, <laughs> what, 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 what twist will this person take to draw me in? You know, it's got dick jokes. It does. <laughs> <laughs> I yes. do. I do. I teach a class to high school teachers about genomics, and so I will tell them this book is wonderful. But please, please don't just hand it to your students. <laughs> well, they yeah. might love it, but their parents might not. This okay. is probably the, the, only, the only genetics book that needs one of those parental advisory stickers on it. <laughs> I suppose. I, I, well, like I said, it's, it's, not the, um, it's not the kids who will have, well, maybe a few, but some parents like, oh, my goodness, so oh why? So, but anyway, this book, uh, Herding Hemingway's Cats, Understanding How Our Genes Work, is really it's a delight. It's in a conversational tone. I mean, literally, she's having conversation with scientists, and it it brings you up to date. So, if you sort of the last book you read about genomics was the Genome Autobiography of a Species by Matt Ridley from <laughs> 10, 12 years ago. Happened. I say you need an update, and this is the book to do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. so. Uh, so on behalf of myself and my co-host Jeff, thank you to all of you who were able to tune in. I, I got some feedback online that there was some buffering issues and things slowing down, so I'm sorry about that. I have nothing to do with that. That must be on a Google level, um, but hopefully the YouTube video will still look wonderful. I enjoyed my conversation at least, so hopefully the rest of you will be able to watch it okay, catch it up later. So, Kat, thank you so much and for taking time thank out from you. your your family visit to uh, to join us. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, guys. Okay, see you guys later. <laughs>